at one point I started just sort of, okay, what, well, I have this stuff here, what can I use at the same time? So that's actually how a lot of that, these ideas started. I had a lovely time chatting with today's guest. He is exploring all sorts of cool musical territory, doing things that I guess you would say are solo bass, but it's so much more than that. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations and Miles Perkin, who's originally from Canada, now living in Berlin. He recently released a solo album called Subtone. So this album, which you just got to go to his Instagram page and check out what he's doing. It's really hard to describe, but he's mixing voice, bass, and we'll just say extended techniques, but that sounds like kind of lame to me compared to what he's doing. It's just incredibly groovy. There's this pop sensibility to what he's doing, in my opinion, and I just totally dig this artist. This is one of these conversations that I still have in the can that happened just before the pandemic hit, so if you're wondering why we're not talking about it, that's why. Amazing what a couple months can bring. But it was great chat. Definitely check out Miles on his website. Check out the album. That's all linked up to in the show notes. And thank you to our longtime sponsors. If there's anything you need in terms of bass gear or accessories or music practice materials or that sort of thing, visiting these people who have been with the podcast for years or over a decade for a few of them, uh, I'd appreciate it. I know they'd appreciate it. And those people are... Dario Strings, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, Steve Swan String Bass, Colstein Music, A440 Violin Shop, and Modacity. And hey, how about we listen to a little bit of this new album from Miles Subtones? We'll have a little at the intro and a little at the outro. And without further ado, let's chat with Miles. How's it going, Miles? Good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Th- thanks for finding some time. How, how are you doing? Of course, man. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Nice. I'm good. What's What's it like in Berlin? Are you in? Are you home right now? Are you in Berlin yeah, right I'm now? I'm home in Berlin. So okay. yeah, it's, uh, it's actually the first sunny day in a while, so that's, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that pretty standard for Berlin, like Berlin winters? I've 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 been there like very very briefly, not and it was in the summer. So, oh yeah, the summer is beautiful. It, yeah, in the winter it's 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 cloudy and yeah, okay. rainy a lot of the time. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty standard kind of fog, cloud, rain. <laughs> yeah, so I'm... so this is sort of a, yeah, this is feeling like the. Yeah, when the sun comes out in the spring, it's a very good, that very is, good day. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, I'm curious, where are you from in Canada exactly? I come from Manitoba, a okay. small town called Brandon. Okay. Brandon, Manitoba. Yeah, it's uh, two hours west of Winnipeg. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I come from not too far off from where you are. I'm from South Dakota. So if you go to Winnipeg, yeah, and it's like, it's like six hours. And I like Sioux Falls, South Dakota is my hometown. And that is as, as cold as I can ever imagine wanting to be. And I think like, man, what's it like to drive six hours north from this uh, horrifically cold place? I mean, I guess it can't get much colder, but. but It's similar, I think. It's like, I mean, we're, yeah. You just go past Fargo and <laughs> you're, in the, <laughs> you're in the territory there. So. How how big was how big is the town you're from? It's some. I think it's somewhere around fifty thousand people. Oh man. Okay. Okay. There's probably a lot in common with South Dakota or just that region, you know, like, like I'm I, Sioux Falls when I left was just around a hundred thousand people. And then the next biggest town is Rapid City, which is like 50,000 or something like that, or 60,000. And, and I think, y- you know, you got to drive 300 miles from Rapid City to hit anything, you know, approaching, uh, even medium sized town. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I've actually I've been to Rapid City before. Oh, you have? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, we had this my wife and I had this had this uh idea for a long time of like moving out to Rapid City or like one of the small towns around there and just sort of it's a it's a beautiful part of the country, but life took us other places and that's yeah. that's okay. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> you're in you're sort of in the San Francisco area. I, no? I, yeah, I'm actually in really? San, I'm in San Francisco, oh, uh, nice. like right in right right on the waterfront. So yeah, it's uh, I'll take it, especially when I talk to my mom about what it's like in South Dakota. <laughs> you know, in January, February. So no, it's it's great. Yeah, how um, what was uh, so like where I'm from was pretty musically. There was a lot going on in Sioux Falls. You know, it was like a a big enough place to have some jazz and we would have community theater and we had an orchestra and that kind of thing. Like, did you have that growing up where you're from? I mean, there wasn't really necessarily an orchestra, but it's a really strong music community in Brandon. Um, The university had, um, well, still has, and it's always traditionally had a very very strong music program yeah. so actually I did some when I graduated high school I I did a couple of years studying at that program in Brandon before I went over to Montreal to McGill um, because at that time Brandon didn't have a jazz program and since then they've you know it's been about 10 years now they've had one there so okay okay and um yeah and also the high school music education there was very strong and like um yeah with kind of concert bands and jazz kind of big bands and some combos and and things like that so um yeah and my father was actually on the fringes of being like part of that he was an english teacher at the school but he also was a rock and roll guitar player and singer. And he sort of invented his own music programs in the school, which was like teaching guitar and just sort of like strum open string chords and teaching basically pop songs. And that sort of turned into actually a real rock band program where they started, yeah, getting all the amps and equipment and everything. So that was kind of my introduction was he was already running that when I was sort of four years old. So I would just go to the school and go to these rock band rehearsals nice. with high school students, you know. So. <laughs> were you uh, did you w- were you starting off on guitar? Like when you actually started playing something or, or was it bass or what, what was it? It's the first thing. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. That makes sense. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, how did, I got into that, I think, actually through just going with my with my dad to the school because he would just mark papers mm-hmm. and his office was in the music room. So he'd grade his English papers while I just sort of used the music room as a playground, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and gradually I would just end up going to the drum set all the time until, you know, I finally got one. But that was maybe I was probably six years old or something when I got a drum set. Wow. Okay, that's cool. You're you you've got you got a Brian Bromberg style background. You know, he 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 started on drums too. And I was talking to him about like how how drums ha- um, maybe impacted the way he ended up playing, like electric or upright bass or something like that. Did w- w- when when did when did bass come into the picture for you? Was that early on too? Or? That was pretty late because yeah. um, I think I sort of. I was playing guitar a lot and drums a lot and I was playing some piano and it got sort of when high school was kind of coming to an end, I kind of had to make a decision of, okay, what am I going to get serious about? And I think all of those things, I couldn't really imagine, okay, like I'm just going to practice <laughs> drums for the rest of my life. Like I, it's, I, I love it, but it's not somehow it's like I, I was also wanting to take advantage of being able to play in orchestras and, um, and I mean, I, that's, I think, what attracted me to the bass was just you can really kind of um, fit it into almost any musical context you want. I think it has this kind of special privilege that way where it's, um, yeah, so it wasn't until I was like 16 when, and it was just about time to start auditioning for universities. And I kind of had like one year to just sort of fake until you make it. <laughs> Well, I'm I'm not surprised. I mean, given given like listening to you, which I I, I really dig what you do. I think I think it's it's incredibly interesting. And like, I guess I'm not surprised that you have that kind of background uh, coming from these different areas. Just like, and especially with drums, like given how you like working in like you know very you know the kick drum and a bunch of other things into your into your uh, into what you do. So that that definitely makes makes sense. Yeah, it was sort of a natural progression it wasn't necessarily like uh, oh, i have this idea i'm gonna 
do. It's just sort of it's just sort of approaching music, I guess, the way I've always sort of done it, which was a bit just messing around with <laughs> instruments, you know. What? And the bass, I guess that's that's yeah, like the drums definitely had a huge impact in terms of just I mean I I I guess also when I started playing bass, it's like, okay, I would get a chord symbol and it's the classic, okay, learn a few open strings and you have a gig. Because it's like, I don't know, I, I know what C means, but I don't know what all these triangles and M7, and I'm like, I have no idea what this is at the, at the beginning. But I would get on these jazz gigs and I'd just play the roots, but really strong rhythmically. And so that's sort of how I started. My, my rhythm was at the beginning much farther ahead than any of the scales or arpeggios or things which you know come later yeah well that's not a, that's not a bad way to start out if you're gonna play some things play the roots and play them strong and you're gonna you're probably over 50 percent of the way there probably 80 percent of the way there you know yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then start adding some thirds and man, you're uh, oh wow set. you're good you're set for life <laughs> Um, what, what did you think you were going to, like when you were looking for universities and think, and you know, uh, ended up at McGill, like what did you have in, did you have in your mind what you're doing now? Because like, I, I love what you're doing now because it is so, um, it's, it's so compelling, but it, it, there's no like, uh, there's no major for that (laughs) in music school. I would wager, uh, you know. No, not at all. Um, no, I don't think I ever really had that in mind. I mean, I, I really, I really went because I really wanted to get into playing jazz and be part of a, a big, a bigger music scene. Um, and at the time, I mean, Winnipeg, which was close, had a strong music scene, but I mean, nothing in those days, nothing like what Montreal could offer. So I figured if I was going to move, I might as well go to uh, really one of the one of the big places. And, you know, I thought about Toronto as well. Those were kind of the two options for like the big jazz programs. And somehow when I visited both cities, Montreal just felt really welcoming and I already knew a couple of people there. And I need to go, I need to go spend some time there because it seems like a play. And again, I've, I, I'm so bad about visiting Canada. I have, I have gone to like Sault Ste. Marie, I think is the only, I've, I've never even been to Toronto. I haven't even been to Vancouver and it's just a trip off the coast nor Montreal, but I've heard it's an amazing place. And I, I, I a friend of mine, Olivier Babaz, you know, it does. Uh, I know who that is. Yeah. Right. So he is somebody also in a different way than you certainly, but he's exploring the base in really unusual ways with the Limba and uh, jazz Boeing and and I was talking to him just about the musical scene there. It seems like a really rich uh, musical uh, culture there, like lots of jazz and experimentation and improvisation. Like, what's what's that town like, just in terms of a place to be a musician? I mean, I, I had a great time there. I spent a, a little over ten years there, oh. and um, I mean, I feel like that's where I really um, it, it's still a, Montreal is a huge part of sort of my my blood, I guess, you know, so, and, um, and just so many different scenes and influences, but it's, it has the advantage of, um, I mean, I think it's spread out a little more now, but when I was there, it had the highest concentrated concentration of artists and musicians in a small amount of space. I think in actually the the neighborhood I was in, I think it might even be North America, the kind of most condensed, because it's just like, it's on an island and then on the island, the area where sort of everyone was living was so condensed, I guess. I mean, McGill is kind of down there and then just everyone in the city at that time, it was it was still quite cheap to live, which it's not the case anymore, but it meant like artists were just really could take over the center of the city. So yeah. there's something there's something so special about that, you know, that magic of like being concentrated like that uh, here in San Francisco, things have changed with tech and all the, the housing values and stuff. Probably there's some parallels to Montreal, but like back back, you know, and, and still to an extent. But especially if you go back 20 years, 30 years, even back to like the beatneck era, um, you know, there's some this town is like wedged onto this little peninsula. It's water all around. It's mountains to the south, and so, um, and even now, I feel I, I feel like I draw so much inspiration from like being around artists and creativity in a way that's just so different from like a more spread out place. So that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you just step outside and you're sort of in, in your in your office basically. Yeah. yeah. While you're booking on the street and <laughs> set up rehearsals for the day out there. And, yeah, I mean, I think. There was 
six or seven really top-notch recording studios within a seven walk from my house. So, what what uh, what drew you to to Europe to Berlin? Like, how did that? When did that? When did that happen? Uh, how how did that manifest? That's been ten years ago. Okay. Um, yeah, like I, I met my girlfriend who was from. Uh, she was from Dresden, and Berlin was sort of a place we could both imagine being. And it was a city I also visited and was really, the music scene I was pretty interested in, because it, I mean, as diverse as Montreal was, I came here and there was a lot of music that was, I'd never heard anything like it. So that was sort of, you know, a big eye opener. Yeah, I've mm-hmm. heard, I've heard that I've heard that about Berlin and the music scene. It just sounds like an, and again, I need to go there and and spend more than like a night, you know, and and actually explore. But like, uh, what's what's the scene like? I'm I'm guessing it's bigger than Montreal, um, just in terms of what, what, like what, just what's what's the musical scene like there? Maybe in terms of what you do, I, I you know, I know like the Philharmonie and all the classical side of things, but yeah, yeah, and that's a big thing. And then I. What, what, what I love about it, it's actually, I've been here for 10 years and I still can't really answer that question, but I keep discovering new pockets of musicians doing another different thing. Um, and, and yeah, there's, there's just all kinds of stuff. I mean, like the improvised music world. I mean, I think when I got here, it seemed like there was a pretty firm line with um, very noise, minimal, like minimalist kind of noise-based music and really over the top free jazz <laughs> you know so it was and, and, but there wasn't actually at that time there wasn't so much kind of down the middle which is where a lot of say like new york and montreal had a lot more of that range so it was it was just very at that time very extreme and since then and i don't know it, it feels like now it's it's almost anything you want it to be in berlin and i, I it, like i just look at the music listings and i'm like no idea who that is. No idea who that is. No idea who. That, wow! It just okay. I kind of know that person. You know, so there's just so many new people and and so much going on. I haven't. Yeah, I can't. I almost can't keep up with it. Wow, that's cool. Well, yeah, I I would not I would not picture you as fitting into the like extreme free jazz box or the noise music box. You know, definitely like I I, I mean there. But it you, was just like I mean I, I I spent some time kind of doing both of those things. I guess as best I as best I could. So it was, that way it was nice to kind of learn some of these things and go some of these directions. And, yeah. I, I, I hate when people try to characterize like what I do or whatever. Like, so I hate asking the question, but like, how would you describe what you do? Uh, sorry for the lame question, but it's like, it's, 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 I, I just love what you're exploring. And I've got the, I've got the quote on your website here. I think it's like double bassist, improviser, composer, songwriter, singer, multi-instrumentalist, musical explorer, which I, I love, I love, to, you know, that, that kind of, but like if, if you, if you had, if, 15 seconds in the elevator with somebody like how would you how would you describe what you do i think i i, I, mean, I might either just give those six <laughs> key words or um i mean i basically say it's centered around the double bass and rooted from sort of a combination of jazz and rock music mm-hmm. and new music yeah i That's, love i, 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 I <laughs> no go ahead go ahead <laughs> No, it's difficult to say. I, I know I have that. It's a daily problem in my life. Is I meet somebody new and just try to actually explain what it is. Yeah, I I I I love that. Rock is a good word to throw in there too, because there's definitely like I don't want to say a pop sensibility, but there's like a very uh 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 it, it's just a musically enjoyable language that you're exploring. I I find, and I like all kinds of things. I like pushing the boundary and noise music and, and, and free. I mean, I like, I like all, all kinds of things, but, but I, I really, I think there's a very, um, uh, ident- there's a, I, I don't know exactly what I'm trying to say, but your, your musical language, I think is, is pretty, uh, accessible, at least what, what I've heard so far. Well, I think that's, yeah, I'm just trying to wrap up my experience in music somehow into, into what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. 
I, you know, I have the, I have this perception. I think probably a lot of folks in in the states do of like of it of life just being way easier for an independent artist in Europe or in areas of Europe. I mean, it, what's what's that? And, and you were you were in Montreal, so not the states, but you know, North America, and then been in Berlin and done various things. Like, what's the? Is it easier to do to explore your own thing in in Europe, in Germany, and Berlin? I, I'm just curious. That's really hard to say. It's a toss up. Like, it definitely works differently, and it depends also, um, yeah, how how you go about doing things. I mean, in in Canada, also like that's also different than the U.S. because yeah. it's um, there's a lot more emphasis on funding independent artists in Canada, um, and in some ways that actually made it. A, it could, I could say it made it easier there because there was just more options for grants to do your own creative projects. But at the same time here, just in the natural landscape, there is a little more space for that, I think. So it's, it's really a toss off how you wanna do it. And here there's a lot of money definitely in arts and culture and music. Um, but I think it's distributed differently because here there's so many old and like really old traditional institutions that all that budget goes in there. And then what's left over for the small scene is it's growing, but it's uh, it's still a long fight to get it to where it needs to be, I think. Well, and I've also heard that Berlin, and I, I, I've spent some time in Germany, not not a not a ton, maybe a total of like a month and a half or something, but and in different parts, uh, uh, up north by Hamburg and uh, down down south by the French border, and and a little bit in East Germany. But like I've heard, Berlin is like a different world than German than than the rest of Germany, or certainly Western Germany. Like what what's uh, how does Berlin itself differ, like in any way, from other other parts of Germany and in terms of like funding musical culture what people are into more experimental I'm, I'm sure it's different I, I mean I, I mean I think it's a lot like how New York is a kind of uh-huh. an island of itself in yeah. the, like it doesn't necessarily represent the United States in right. that way it's just people like Berlin is similar in that people from all over the place come here um, not necessarily to be in Germany but to be kind of part of what's happening in Berlin it sort of has its own its own thing. And I guess, I mean, uh, it has to be said that the uh, part of it has to do with the, the Berlin Wall and sure. how it was divided. And like that has to be part of the equation because like, um, you know, after the wall fell and it's like, it was just this sort of uh, empty city. And that just means in a way, there's tons of possibilities as far as what could transpire. So I think there's always been this sort of, yeah, yeah. It's deeply rooted that you just kind of had a, a squat and would just sort of do creative things in it. And, you know, that doesn't exist very much anymore, but there's still the spirit of that kind of working process, I guess, is, it's definitely still around. Yeah, there's so, some places that are special like that. And I, I've heard Montreal is a bit like that in, in a really different way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, it's also, that also came down to like the Quebec wanting to separate from Canada and then all the big business pulled out, leaving all these kind of industrial buildings really empty for quite a long time. And sort of that turned into a lot of cheap rehearsal spaces and la la la. Um, so it had a similar, not as drastic thing, but a similar similar thing happened, you know? Yeah, well, it's, you know, in in the states, we've got a similar a similar uh, thing with Detroit, which you know, you got ma- massive industrial, like like ma- massive depopulation and all sorts of things. But now it's a pl- it's it's a great place to be an artist in many ways because you can have space and that. And you look at places like New York in the '70s or San Francisco here in the '70s, and you, you had that. And then now y- y- these cities are so expensive; it's hard to take a chance and actually, you know, y- you know, do. do your craft unless your wife works for Facebook or something like that. You know, it's just a really, it's a tough, it's a tough place to, um, to be able to I- I explore the way that y- you might, uh, want, want to as a, as an artist. Yeah, exactly. You can, 
yeah, get kicked out of your rehearsal space because there's an app company that's making the app that'll help you find a new rehearsal space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a great analogy. That is exactly a, it is. So, it's so funny, like living here to watch, you know, um, I'm, I think I'm one of five bases left living in the actual city of San Francisco. You know, everybody's yeah, moved. Yeah. Kind of wondering how you were doing that. Oh, yeah, well, it's just because it, my wife's a doctor. The only reason it is is because I it is not from my podcasting income. Believe me. Um, uh, but but um, it's it's interesting to just uh, look at what you know how people make it work and and I I've I've never really lived. Chicago is a much more affordable place. People are able to explore, which is where I lived before this. Um, but but it's just interesting. I'm, I'm just always curious by how like the 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 culture of a city and all those external factors kind of kind of shape the artistic scene and when you have a place that's that's big and vibrant and is drawing people from all over the world like berlin or montreal or new york or or uh, here in san francisco i just i just find it interesting what i also find is interesting sorry switching topics slightly is like i'm going i'm going through your instagram and i'm looking at this photo which i have here on my ipad right now of you you're you're uh, talking about your new solo album so the bass is on the floor it's on a rug there are i don't know how many mics here you're drumming you're you're, you're you're drumming on the strings. Um, uh, it, it, I, I'm totally fascinated. I've watched your your preview clip on YouTube, and I've listened to some of your other stuff. So, like, tell me what, what? Tell me about the. I guess that's a very long way to say. Like, tell me about this album that you've got coming out. Uh, that probably will be out when the people hear this. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So it's coming out, and then well, we're a little before the date now, but I guess when people hear it, it'll. <laughs> It'll be out already, uh, March thirteenth. Um, yeah, so this is this is basically just um, it's my solo album. So I'm I'm playing. <laughs> I'm, it, it's centered around the bass, definitely, um, and I'm using some sort of let's say alternative amplification ideas, where I, I'm kind of using some guitar amps. Um, and that's kind of taking care of some of the effects and just sort of expanding some of the some of the sounds outwards. Um, yeah, and there's seven tracks on the album. I recorded it in Montreal with a really really fantastic sound engineer named Vid Cousins. Um, yeah, and the way we, we recorded it was basically just got the raw bass tracks together. Anything that we would want to put into the amps, we just sort of saved them and went into another studio and threw the sound into the amps and um, yeah just sort of got a really big room sound and uh, yeah it's all based off of what I do live so it's not um, it's not anything overdubbed that I don't do at all at the same time in the live performance of course like I sang separate from recording the bass because that just doesn't sound good to record it together, but uh, it's basically all material that was developed to be part of a live set. So, so yeah, I'm getting ready to kind of go on the road in a couple of weeks to play a few shows around Germany, and yeah, I'm looking forward to getting it out there. And, well, it is yeah. it, it is super. It, what I've what I've seen so far is super cool, and I've got like far too many questions, but let me just pepper you with a few. So, like like um uh for like for the album, is this was this all uh, sketched out in your mind beforehand? Is there improvisation going on, like when you're actually in the recording studio? Or are these like, is this something that you do the same? Like, is this a, is this precomposed, or is this like in the moment, or how this does that work? Pretty, this is, um, it's pretty much precomposed okay. with some, like let's say, flexible parameters. Sometimes, mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was actually developed um, because I've been doing a lot of music for theater plays here, where I'm. I'm the only musician on stage and I'll sort of have a guitar and some drums and the bass will be there and, you know, I'll sort of play different instruments at different times, depending what the piece needs. And then um, at one point I started just sort of, okay, what, well, I have this stuff here. What can I use at the same time? So that's actually how a lot of that, these ideas started coming together. Um, and some of the ideas were used in the theater pieces and then to make the album, I would just take the little idea from that and turn it into just sort of a more fully structured song idea or a, a longer arc kind of composition. Wow. Yeah, so that was again, just sort of, uh, it's, it was sort of like one thing leads to another and, and this is kind of the end result of, of those experiences, I guess. 
you know, it, it's it's just so yeah. Okay, well that makes sense. That 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 that, that it came from there. That's really cool that you do that. So that's like a like a theater. Is it is in like is it a like a, a actors a production or is yes, it like it's actors? Um, it's yeah. Like there's, I mean, in Berlin, like there's I think seven or eight big theater houses that have a couple of stages and ensembles of actors and um, yeah, it's really like traditional. German theater system, the wow. system. Um, so yeah, there's one director I've been working with pretty consistently for the last 10 years, actually, his name is Armin Petras. Um, and yeah, so it's just been like a lot of material generated for his, for his work. So that, that definitely also had part of, part of the role in developing this yeah. music. Wow, that's so cool! That's so cool that you do that. That's great. That's like that. that picturing like, you know, mus- musicians accompanying silent films or something like that back a hundred years ago, you know, and like that sort of that sort of lineage. It's, yeah, it's a pretty. I mean, it's kind of in a way that's kind of like my day job. So it's a pretty cool job to have. Is sort of just coming up with coming up with stuff for the for the stage, trying to make the you know the dynamics right and. It's interesting, yeah, to work with other forms all the time. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's great. It's it's that's what a cool uh, what a cool influence to have on so, on something that eventually is a solo project. Actually, that makes a lot of sense. Um, given, I, I was I was just curious how how that sort of evolved. I I've got a weird question for you, but I just I'd love to. So like you you explore so many different paths. Like c- could you? Uh, like, like, um, you probably have a ton of musical influences, you know, be, uh, uh, w- w- let's just say you had to name like five desert Island recordings, like five recordings. You, you, you're, you're stranded at sea and you can only take five, uh, sorry to throw the weird question, but I'd, I'd love to know what, what, what some of those like major influences might be. Okay. Off the top. These are difficult. <laughs> I know. Sorry. My, there has to be some miles Davis, uh, 60s quart, quint, quintet in there, like uh, Water Babies is one I really like, or Feed a Kilimanjaro, um, something like that. Um, I'm just going through different kind of places of music. Uh, Bill Callahan is a songwriter. I, I, I kind of get obsessed with his songs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> his song. uh, man. Oh God! I don't. Really, I don't even know if I can name two, five. Two, two is fine. But, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this feeling of like it could be so many things. <laughs> I know. I know. I don't. I don't know what I would say either. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, um, the. W- yeah, it's 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 super interesting. The 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 ter- and it, you also you also gig with uh, you got a quartet too. Yeah, I have a quartet as well. Yeah. So how does that all? So you're playing the theater now. You're going on. A, you're doing a solo tour, which is very cool. I, I I wish I could check out one of those shows. I love seeing what people. Larry Grenadier was just doing a solo bass tour. Um, oh yeah, his solo album. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's great. And and I got a chance to check him out here in San Francisco, and it was really cool because he was playing at SF Jazz, and which is one of the main concert venues. And it's like a Friday night. And I'm thinking, man, I'm why I'm in one of the major concert halls in this city, and the show tonight is so. Solo double bass. You know, I just thought like, how how cool is that? Um, and he's exploring in a very different way than what you're doing. But like, you know, he's doing all these alternate tunings and different things and the gleaners and his, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got so you got the theater and now you're and then you've got what you're doing solo bass. You got your quartet. Like, what? How does that all fit together for you? Like, what's the rest of the year look like for you? Or what is what does the past year look like for you? Just like what's what's your life look like in terms of? I mean, it's it's just a it's a real juggling act. Like between, um, it's it sort of goes in like kind of one month periods of focusing on this for a while and then focusing on that for a while. Um, the theater production is usually always kind of two months in rehearsals and developing these things. And then then they just play, um, let's say, two or three times a month for the whole, maybe the whole year or sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. Some of them run for up to three years, but at that point it's maybe just one time a month. So it's kind of all consuming when I'm in the rehearsals and then when I'm out, then um, there's time for 
time for other things. And there's always a, you know, a chance to get away to play some other concerts or have different projects going on in parallel. Um, yeah, and then my, like the quartet, we, we're not playing so much. We've kind of got together for a week to put the music together and record it. Um, and then, yeah, we, we only have a kind of a handful of gigs this year. But, um, yeah, but I'm, I'm working on hopefully we can get some more yeah. performances with that next year because I, I really love playing with those guys. It's uh, yeah, a trumpet player named Tom Arthurs who I play with in a lot of configurations, but he's a uh, yeah, really beautiful trumpet player, a uh, piano player named Benoit Delbecq. And he's, um, yeah, we, I mean, we have a lot in common in the way that he does a lot of prepared piano combined with sort of melodic ideas and shapes and colors. Um, um, so yeah, that's a really nice fit. And a really nice drummer from New York named Jim Black, who is quite well known, I guess, in the New York scene and I mean, the global yeah. jazz world. Um, yeah, so outstanding drummer and yeah, privileged to play with those guys. That's cool. Is that, what, how about in terms of, um, so you're doing this solo tour, touring in general, are you on the road a lot or are you typically staying mostly in Berlin? Not so. I try to not be on the road too much. Like it's sort of, um, I mean, I also have two kids so that yeah. you, you just can't right. be doing it all the time. You, know? so you have to be at school and daycare and yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be in Berlin as much as possible, but then for special occasions, try to get out and do a handful of shows a few times a year just to stay connected and get, yeah. you know, that's a good that's a good way to do it uh, particularly with the kids but like even in general like like man I've spent so much time on the road the last couple of years and I keep thinking like I love San Francisco why am I trying so hard to get away from San Francisco and I, I, get, I get like I lose my grounding and I feel like I I feel like I'm not as creative even even when I get time and I'm I mean in some ways the road inspires me in different towns and see and I love travel and that sort of thing but I I, I find it very hard to um, get, really do anything substantial uh, on my creative project because just so much of my energy is is taken up with the, you know, load in, load out, uh, catch the plane, you know, adjust the, to the time difference or or whatever, all that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a balance that needs to be struck though. So it's somehow like if you don't do any playing or touring, then it's it's really hard to keep momentum being creative if if you're sort of also not reaching out because you reach out and you get home and then you're like i want to do something like this next time and yeah, yeah. No I, no, I hear you. And I, I, I can be very introverted if I'm, if I'm not care. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but like if I get very, uh, comfortable in my predictable routines and I, I do find that, that getting out and going, I was just in England uh, about a month ago and I was, I don't bouncing all over the place the last couple of weeks. But so I do find inspiration from that, but there's also like, uh, it, it, if I'm not careful, I just like, it burns me out. I like can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 is, <laughs> what is what does time on the base look like with you like do you do you um do you have i, I just and I'm, I'm always fascinated with people that that do something that's uh you know i play orchestra gigs and play solo pieces and that's about it so i, I don't think of my time on the base as particularly improvisatory i do a little bit but like like so i have a pretty predictable routine i try to go through every day do you have like a practice routine or do you set some a time aside to explore this super cool stuff that you're doing on the instrument how does that work i mean that usually comes from just being in different situations and just when i pick the bass up that's what i often tend to do is sort of um it's half practicing and half sort of composing using whatever repertoire of sounds i'm interested in um and then I, there is a bit of a practice routine and it's just the, in, like, actually the, these days I've been doing it a lot when I feel like, um, yeah, if I just want to make sure I'm in really good shape, I basically have two different exercises I do and they're incredibly boring, but for me, they just sort of lock everything into place. And if I do them every day for two months, I, I feel invincible. So, it's like, so um, if I don't, if I don't ask you what they are, people will write in and yell at me. So yeah, <laughs> yeah tell me what they are. It's, it's really simple. Like one is for the left hand one, like one is for the left hand and 
using the bow, and the other one is just for the right hand open strings. So it's sort of, uh, I, I sort of have a pattern of string crossing exercises. I think Dave Holland was where that, I, it might, well, it might come from a Zimmerman book that then Dave mm. Holland passed on to somebody else who passed on to somebody else who passed it on to me. So it's been filtered through a few things, but it's just sort of really every imaginable string crossing combination and just focus on sound. And it's basically just a lot of repetitions and it helps build up the fingers and calluses and get an even sound and hmm. um, just sort of takes all the, so you can kind of go anywhere over the strings at any time, basically. And then the left hand is um, with the bow is double stops, almost sort of variations on like the tracky kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's just sort of trills, these trills and turns that I have from somewhere on some, but he did a really basic finale thing on a thing that says title at the top. <laughs> I just I don't remember who made it, but like, I, it's just like I have this exercise and I'm like, this is, it's just perfect for just locking the hand position and intonation and it goes through all the combinations of double stops. And to get the tuning perfect also means your bow arm needs to be working properly. So, yeah, if anybody knows what Miles is talking about, right in the, yeah, the famous finale piece called Title. I, I'm familiar with that. You know, those, those exercises, uh, David Allen Moore, who's one of the bass players in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, he did a, he did a course for Discover Double Bass recently, which with, with these different permutations, it's like a fifth tritone, major third, minor third, major third, tritone, fifth, or something like that. You know, like, a, and Petrachi has similar things, but there's this one exercise I've learned too, and it sounds very similar to that, and I, I, I have no idea where I learned it. I learned it somewhere, and then I saw Dave Moore talking about it, and so I'd love to know the origin of that. But sometimes the best stuff is like what you're describing. It's like from a Zimmerman book, and then a couple of people filtered it to to be the you know to sort of like take the most useful element. Yeah, and I think just people are kind of digging deep into how you can get a just how you can get the bass resonating as much as possible. So there was yeah just some lessons with, uh, he was a big, great bass player out of Montreal at the time named George Mitchell. I don't think any, yeah, any, anybody outside of Montreal or Toronto, yeah, he sort of disappeared at one moment, but he, um, yeah, he, he went into incredible detail on the string crossing stuff and just was, did wonders for my sound. So that was nearly 20 years ago. He showed it to me and I, I try to do it. I try to do it every day. It doesn't always work. <laughs> well, it's, re it's really interesting for both of those exercises. When I got to university, I went to Northwestern University in, in just outside of Chicago. And my teacher, Michael Hovnanian, the first thing he laid on me in my first lesson was a string crossing exercise. And he said something to the effect of this, this is what like opened the door for me to eventually get into the Chicago Symphony and other things. And, and then what you do with double stops, you know, Gary Carr starts every single day, still to this day, playing double stops. He finds that that's the yeah and a lot I've, I've, ta I've talked to and read about and heard and watch videos from various other you know violinists cellists who talk about the importance of double stops because it's like I mean it's it's twice the challenge in a lot of ways and it and it's so helpful for intonation and just unlocking all kinds of things I I spend far too little time I, I'm gonna when we're done today I'm gonna go practice some double stops you've you've inspired me <laughs> yeah well I mean because it, it, it just like it tells you right away how out of tune you are like if you have like you have to get these intervals correct and then when they're locked in it's like your your left hand almost can't go wrong you know mm -hmm. so i really i re i find those so valuable when you're I'd love to know, and again, it's like the, I, I find it so fascinating people who explore the bass in way, nobody's doing exactly what you're doing, but, but exploring the bass, you know, outside of maybe a more traditional jazz orchestral context, like, do you, what, to what extent do you write anything down? Like, let's say you're getting a good groove that eventually becomes one of these solo pieces. Like, do you write anything on, in any in traditional notation or write it down? Or like, do you record yourself? Like, for me, I, th I feel like I would get a great idea and I just lose it immediately. Like, how do you capture that? I mean, I record, I record things quite a lot. When okay. it's, yeah, I, I, do, I do that a lot. Um, I, I really only use, like, notation, writing things down to write for other people or, or things where like we, we all need to be looking at the same 
sheet of music. So for solo, it never really made sense. It's also I'm managing so many other objects that like oh, sh managing sheets on top of it is <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> right. <laughs> I, just, yeah, you have to, yeah, with all the technology and setting up the drums and preparations for the instrument and, and mic stands and place it. And then I'm like, oh, a music stand. No, for, forget it. <laughs> it's easier than that. <laughs> so record yeah, that makes sense recording recording yourself uh do, do you uh just record on your phone or do you uh like like you know inspiration strikes and yeah i do like, all kinds of stuff i do it yeah like sometimes just if it's there i just quickly hit record on the phone um sometimes just for practicing i might set a good mic up in front of the bass and just record for a while and not even keep it mm -hmm. but just so immediately after I played, just listen, just to see what the bass sounds like on the other side in a reasonably nice recording setup, you know? And and if I have that stuff, or, or then if I have a collection of ideas that it's, I want to take it somewhere further, then I'll really spend the day just recording them all and maybe editing them, you know, figure, you know, so that's even part of the composition pro process sometimes. It's like playing all this material and then, editing all the stuff that doesn't sound very good out and then you're like okay this and this sound good now how can i actually make that transition without you know how do i do that live without you know using software to do yeah. it you know so it's just sort of that reflection from you know the ears from the outside are really important in that stuff i find yeah, it's cool. You're using recording as like just a, a another tool, like like a piece. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny. I think maybe maybe I I get, I'm stuck in like my no, 1990s. You know, having to actually use physical media re to record things. I think oh, I don't want to I don't want to waste a cassette. Yeah, you know. But like like I think it's a good uh, move. And I, I actually do this myself to to a degree. Just record yourself and don't have any expectation of keeping it. The point's not to keep it. It's just like a a reference, like a like it's just another tool and you maybe you'll keep it but but or you just like you said just listen back to uh, to think about tone or maybe maybe i I, lo I love the idea of using it to kind of like fuel a composition like that like oh this bit's interesting this bit's interesting that's a that's a really uh it, it makes sense but i never really thought about using it like that i find it super almost indispensable is it yeah and you'll just kind of come up with things you'd never think of sticking together sometimes or but yeah. <laughs> what what on earth do you bring to a gig? Like what what does your travel setup look like? You got your bass, you've got like what like how much are you uh, yeah for this for the solo, I mean uh yeah, I mean I hopefully the club or something will have like an amp and drums and a PA so it okay. doesn't get <laughs> yeah. too crazy. But um <laughs> no but say like yeah, like I, I I have to pack the car with a bass drum, snare drum the hardware for those things, the bass, uh, a kind of standard size guitar amp, a small guitar amp. Depending on the venue, if it's somewhere that doesn't have like a good PA, then I also need to take a bass amp. <laughs> you know, uh, it gets, uh, yeah, it's a bit crazy. Um, I mean, luckily all this stuff I can also just do with the acoustic bass and it doesn't, you know, when if it's say like a house concert or something, then it, I can, you know, sort of find variations of the material to do it really just stripped down to acoustic bass and that's it. So it can be sort of the max setup all the way down to nothing. So it's a little bit flexible, I guess. Do, do you, I don't, I don't recall seeing you doing any looping in anything you do. Do you ever do looping in live performance or do you, do you stay um, away from that mostly? I used to a little bit. Um, I have an old solo album from 2008, and I think there's two loops on it, but those are like, yeah, where you can't really tell it's a loop, like it's more like for atmospheric or, yeah. Um, but no, I've, I, I've, I, I have used loops in the past just to try them out, but I always end up throwing them away. I don't know, there's something that just bugs me about them. <laughs> <laughs> there, well, there's something cool about, I, I don't know if this makes sense, but I, I was talking to another bassist named Sam Suggs, who, who composes, not in the, it's a, a different style. He does like things that sort of resemble EDM, you know, but, but on, the, on solo bass. And Sam is always going for, I mean, not always, but Sam enjoys making music that sounds like you're looping, but you're not looping. And I, I, and I kind of get that with like, with what you're doing. It's like, oh, wow, if I was, if I wasn't watching a video of you doing this, I might very 
well think there were well I'd probably think there were multiple musicians or 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 that you're looping but I think there, there's something so cool in in just the analog nature of like doing doing everything at the same time without relying on loops so I just I just think there's something kind of awesome about that well it's just I, I see so many concerts of really any any type of musicians and sort of pop music or something and I, it, there's just always this moment where it's like okay the music sounds cool but like if nobody's actually doing anything like it's like okay they've played in the loops and then they just stop and there's this <laughs> awesome music going on and like they're not doing anything yeah but it's like some, somehow it's just like it's yeah, it just bugs me every time. I know, I know. I like, I like to think that I, I, I there's, I know. Well, there's something I, I like the idea of. We, I could go back 150 years and play and and still make music, you know. Or I could go back 50 years. Yeah, there is something kind of freaky about about like all of a sudden everything's electronic. Like, what if the if the power goes out, the music dies, you know? Um. So I I, I also like that sort of just uh. The, the, there's something there's something uh you know I like the handmade nature of just like the truly acoustic that's probably why i play acoustic bass but you know yeah exactly <laughs> yeah i'm the same that way i think well it, miles uh hopefully this is the first i was looking back in my notes recently and i've had some people on the podcast there's this bassist uh named danny zeman i think i've had him on the podcast seven times at this point so so uh, if you're if you're down in the future the next album the next project you got coming let's just have this be the first of many because i i love i love ch- i love chatting with people and, and getting to know where they're from and the backstory and i love that even though we're probably to drive from your hometown to my hometown would probably still be 12 hours <laughs> you know at least it it feels like we're from if you look at a map it, you're relatively from similar part of the world um, but i'd love the next the next project whether it's a solo album or a quartet project or anything let's uh let's 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 do this again yeah absolutely I'd love uh, to. and i'll link up to everything i like oh yeah for sure i'll link up to your your website and uh youtube and all instagram and social media um and maybe i can just wrap up i i don't i never have anything set for these but except i do have one quasi traditional question which is like go back to your uh, time in your past like let's say when you were eventually went to mcgill so maybe when you were looking for school or you just got started at mcgill what would what would you tell young miles now given what you've done oh man sorry <laughs> another <laughs> don't do it man <laughs> yeah maybe exactly <laughs> no, no, no. um Wow, that's a. <laughs> oh, it's so hard to put myself back in that position, um, but I think it, it's it's just always just follow your interests, whatever your, whatever is kind of like, uh, whatever you're excited to be doing, like dive in and 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 do it, and that you know that's going to change over time. I think. I, 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 I hear you. I was just at, I was at the Lionel Hampton jazz festival just a few days ago, uh, out here on the West coast. And, and, uh, that exact advice was, was being given. There were a bunch of people who were like 14 to 18 years old and like trying to figure out like what really, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you think about? What really gets you excited? You know, I, I think about that. Like there is like, and you're you're a, you're an inspiration, I think, to a lot of people because there's no there's no like path for what you do. There's no, I mean, I don't not that I'm aware of. There's no major for uh, combining singing and playing drums and and bass and uh, you know exploring Berlin. I mean, it's it's there's so many there there are so many ways to do this thing we call music and you know finding set like like finding something that really makes you excited uh it just seems so so critical it seems cheesy but i think it's just so key for uh you know a, a satisfying artistic life or life in general <laughs> absolutely nice <laughs> Miles, 
Thank you so much for chatting. And I hope you're doing well in these strange times and making good music. And looks like you are since this album came out between when we chatted and this is being released. And yeah, can't wait to see a show in person whenever in-person shows happen again. But really cool stuff. Definitely check out his Instagram. Check out his Facebook. Certainly check out the album, his website. And yeah, I just get so inspired by what the people that I talk to on the podcast are doing. I learn so much. And that's something that I just like about doing something like a podcast. I tell people, and rarely do they take me up on this, although some do, that pretty much everybody would benefit from starting a podcast. Maybe not everybody if you're, well, maybe everybody, but it is a great self-improvement project. It makes me reach out to people I don't know, uh, listen to music that I might not listen to, do research, listen to people as I'm talking to them, getting to know them, trying to frame what, have to have a normal conversation, of course, but also try to explore territory that hopefully you listening find interesting and perhaps inspire me, inspire me, <laughs> oh God, Jesus, inspiring or educational. And I think that that's just one of the benefits of doing something like this. It gets you better at public speaking, <laughs> contrary to how these outros are going, but it's, it's just an incredible thing to do. The only downside is work, but uh, that's okay. What in life is good that doesn't also require work. Not much. Maybe this uh, pink grapefruit soda I'm drinking here. That's pretty good. But anyway, okay. So I have had such a great time doing this podcast, even in this pandemic situation and doing more and more of them. And I'm doing a lot of them on video these days, which frankly, I've kind of done that anyway, but had really mixed results and spotty internet connections. And we did not get this one video with Miles, but when I do, I'm going to try to put them out. And we've got a growing playlist over at youtube.com slash contraways conversations. Or just go to our website and you can find it. So if you want to see, and, and, I, and let me know what you think of those. So far, it's just a little intro from me and then I'm just dumping the conversation online, they could get more intricate. We could have some musical interludes and that sort of thing. I'm a little leery about building out something that's hard to maintain when things do go back to normal. But if there is something that would be valuable that you see in there, let me know. Feedback at Contraface Conversations. And yeah, I think it's going to do it. Thank you to the team. That team is Mitch Mooring. I'm going in weird order today, but that's okay. Trevor Jones, Krista Copper, Michael Cooper, and Steve Hinchy. And Mitch makes beautiful bases just outside of Dallas-Fort Worth. Has a really cool-looking store. I'd love to visit someday when I can visit places again. And at Kilgore, Texas, downtown Kilgore, Texas. I think east, a couple hours of Dallas-Fort Worth. Won an award for Tone Silver Medal. I believe, at the 2019 ISB convention. Super cool. Thank you to Mitch and everybody who puts these together. Thank you especially to you for listening. I so appreciate it. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Bye.